Hello, this is Grant Kirkhope. This is David Wise. And you're listening to XVGM Radio. And you're listening to XVGM Radio. Welcome to XVGM Radio, where the bits keep coming. I'm Mike. And I'm Justin. And this is episode 51, Ukulele Back to the Fluture, with David Wise and Grant Kirkhope. (laughs) O-M-G. Can't believe it. Wow. (laughs) Guys, thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us on this amazing episode yeah Uh, you are uh grant kind of fulfilled my wildest perfect dark desires on episode 30 30, when we had him on and we talked for oodles amounts of time about joanna dark and her adventure and surprisingly he came back yes i know i'm (laughs) shocked so today we have him yeah that that was a long that was a very long conversation it was was that the longest amount of time that you've ever talked about perfect dark like in one day yeah like most definitely i wasn't expecting to be quite that long Uh, so it was a long time (laughs) well we'll try to keep it a little bit shorter this time but it's going to be tough because we have david wise also here with us and i don't think david wise needs too much introduction both of these guys were rare composers but of course i believe Mm. david started first and then uh, grant jumped on afterwards so we are going to be talking today about ukulele and ukulele and the impossible lair both of these games are kind of like a resurgence of the 3d action platformer Pl- yeah, collectathon yeah. if you will I don't, I don't say that like demeaningly sure I, I, I collectathon I, I think is a cute term for a lot of these games but yeah uh, yeah very very much in the spirit of like banjo kazooie mm-hmm. yeah absolutely so this interview is being brought to you by materia collective we want to thank them for mm-hmm. allowing us the opportunity to speak to these wonderful gentlemen and of course Platonic Games we want to thank them as well what I'd like to do first is just a brief introduction to David and uh, Mm -hmm. and Grant Grant of course if you want more in-depth info go listen to that Perfect Dark episode because we talked about his history and everything but uh, let's start with David David what would you say was your musical inspiration growing up like how did you get into becoming a musician a composer etc almost quite by accident really I I was I I like playing piano um, Mm -hmm. when I was younger then I decided I'd play trumpet and I joined a brass band and played that for a while. And then I decided probably 1977, it's quite a long time ago. I was still very young at the time. I decided that I wanted to be a drummer in a punk rock rock band, even though I probably wasn't old enough to be. (laughs) I was doing a paper round at that point. And um, I, I used to wake up every morning at, I don't know, six o'clock, go and do a paper round. And I'd do a paper round in the evening and also on Sundays. And I saved and saved and saved and bought my drum kit. And that's how I got into playing drums. Hmm. Not that I'm very good at playing drums. I just enjoyed it. I <laughs> can't keep time. And then uh, I, I, I joined several bands playing drums and realized I, I wasn't really very good. So I decided I'd move over to keyboards. Mm-hmm. And my, my first keyboard was a Juno 60, and I, I started um, playing in bands then, and that was really when I started composing. So that, that was my introduction mm. to composing. Okay, okay. Uh, Grant could have started a band with David had they met prior <laughs> to working at Rare, because Grant also has a musical background uh, and was in like touring bands. So Grant, give us a little bit of uh, information on, on that, just to kind of recap from the Perfect Dark episode. What's your brief musical history and uh, how you started uh, composing in general? I guess quite similar to Dave, really. I, mean, I did play 
played recorder at the start and then they did a bit of trumpet when I was like six or seven and started playing that properly like classically trained and I ended up going to uh, well and then about, then about 12 or 13 I started playing guitar sort of self-taught metal guitar player rock guitar <laughs> player and then ended up going to the Royal Northern College of Music for four years uh, did a music degree playing trumpet and then I quit that well I passed it in the end and then um, spent the next 11 years playing in bands really like some did terribly and some did all right you know uh, <laughs> and then sort of spent like of those 11 years on and off the dole unemployment benefit you know insurance you call it mm-hmm. uh, so and then uh, I, I met Robin Beeland through bands who's in the same area that I was and he uh, was a keyboard player and he sort of um, one day he announced he got a job and I was like you know no one that I knew got a job we all just played in bands and signed on an unemployment benefit you know most of the time <laughs> um, and he got to have a good job at this company called Rare I was like never heard of them you know what do they do so they write you know, it's computer game music I was like oh my god you know so he'd been there about a year and a half he said to me you know Grant you've been on the dole like you know 11 years don't you think you should maybe you know try to get a job and I said well you know what, what can I do you know so, well, what, do you try to do what I'm doing so he recommended, I bought, he recommended me to buy a bit of gear like an Atari ST and a, a synth and a, mm. you know a copy of Cubase and bits and pieces like that mm-hmm. I sent Dave five cassette head because Dave, Dave's head of music Five cassette, five cassette tapes over the, over the course of that year. It was like 1994. I never got a reply. <laughs> and then after I got a, a letter saying, please come and interview. And, I, and Dave and Sam and Farmer, who was the general manager, interviewed me. And uh, they gave me the job. So I'm very grateful to Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just also, just to, to add to that, I only ever heard your last tape. Oh, number really? One. Yeah. Oh, number oh. one and four never got, got as far as me. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. That's, that's Louise Tilson for you, Dave, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it was but Dave, based on number five. Yeah, but also, Dave, you, you should say how you met Tim and Chris. You, have, you should say how you met them, you know, the music shop thing. Oh, yeah. I, when I was playing in bands, I uh, decided I'd get a job because, you know, it's better than being on the dole. <laughs> so I started working in a music shop in a place called Leicester. Hmm. And it was early days. I, I, was play, I was actually upstairs playing drums and trying to sell drums, and nobody was really interested in drums because, you know, they're quite bulky and noisy. And eventually this chap came in from Yamaha and he had a Yamaha CX-5 and he put it down on the desk and he said, this is the future. <laughs> <laughs> it, it stood there for three months. No, nobody even touched it. <laughs> they, they said, look, it really is the future. And if you sell some, we're, we're actually, we're going to have this deal where if you, if, you, know, you, can have an, you can go home and learn this software and, and how it all works. You can have an extra day off so you can do it at home. And, and I was sold at that point. <laughs> 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 That's so really cool. I, I went home, learned how to use it over several weeks, and then came back in and started hooking it up. It was using MIDI, musical instrument digital interface, is like a five pin thing. We use USB now. Mm-hmm. So I could hook up all these computers and drum machines and, and stuff. And I, I was doing Duran Duran and We Close Our Eyes, those kind of 80s numbers. Yeah. And I've got everything hooked up. And I, I was selling loads of these. I was out selling everybody i was probably selling 90 percent of the stock in the shop at that point wow, wow. And ironically at the time i was i was the t-boy i was on 40 pounds a week you know the the yts scheme supposed to be the youth youth tea making scheme i think or something right. like that <laughs> huh. so um eventually these two gentlemen came in one was called tim the other one was called chris and they said oh can we have a demonstration so i, I said everything going played them all the chart hits of the day and they said well do you have anything else? And I embarrassingly said, well, I've, I've got a few of my own I've written, but, you know, um, whether they're any good or not, I don't know. So I demonstrated one of them, and um, one gentleman turned to the other and exclaimed, monsters. So I said, well, is that good or bad? So <laughs> have you got an office? So we went upstairs and thought, yes, sold another one, because I, I was selling quite a few a day at that point. And I thought, well, we, we, he needs to go on finance. So I got the finance papers out, and he said, no, no, I'm, I'm offering you a job. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> wow. So, uh, uh, we bought all the gear that I'd been demonstrating, and I went off to work for Rare, as it was, with Tim and Chris Stamper. That was hmm. the early days of Rare. And I spent the first three weeks playing Super Mario Brothers, getting used to video games. <laughs> okay. And then I spent another two weeks. They, they said, look, go and write some stuff. So I got with these big dreams about what we could do with all this gear, the drum machines and the, the nice synths and samplers. And they, they said, that, that's great, Dave, but now it's got to go on to the NES. <laughs> <laughs> like glorified doorbell, you know, a few bleeps and blops. And it was it was quite a challenge, but um, I, I stuck with it. And all the music I'd written got turned into NES music. Right. That's, yeah, those were the early days. Yeah, that's really cool. That's awesome. Huh. Today, what we're going to do is uh, because we're exploring the games that led up to 
ukulele. We're, mm-hmm. we're going to be not really touching on uh, David's earlier work, like, you know, Battletoads and, and that right, sort right. of like early, early stuff. But instead, we're going to be doing Donkey Kong Country. Right. And we're going to also do Banjo-Kazooie, because of course, those two games kind right. of combined <laughs> in a way are a good showcase for both ukulele and ukulele in the Impossible Lair. So that main thing that we came in on mm-hmm. was ukulele's, ukulele's main, theme. main theme, and that was by Grant Kirkhope. It, it's a good introduction. It's a very like whimsical, fun mm-hmm. song that has. Is, is that a, a pan flute? Is that the Sounds main? Sounds like a yes. recorder. A recorder? Yes, yeah, it's just a recorder. It's okay. actually it's actually me playing ukulele, but that's a sampled recorder. It's it's not me playing that. Okay. 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 Oh, oh, that's a sampled recorder. Right. That, it sounds real nice. It's a good sample, that one. Yeah, because yeah. I, I actually, one of the things that I, that I had noted about it is it sounds very childlike. Like, hearing it the, based on the audio quality and, like, the, the quality of the playing, mm. it, it not that it, the playing sounds bad, but it, it reminds me of, like, a child playing a recorder because yeah. they tend to play really loud and they blow in a certain way. Right. Uh, and the fact that that's just a sample that's <laughs> that, that's being used is really funny. Yeah, it's also impressive, too, because it's... It, it's almost like you can hear the breath. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you can hear the actual blowing of the uh, of the instrument. So <laughs> it's it's pretty pretty well done. Um, yeah, I, did that on purpose. I did that on purpose to make it sound you know rough and play a bit out of time and a bit out of tune and right. Know, so. Yeah, so to try and make it like that, it's supposed to be like childlike. Yeah, right, it's incredibly right. cute. So. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> definitely for sure. So we're gonna start by diving into the past before mm-hmm. we get to the present. So we're gonna start with Donkey Kong Country. This came out in the Super NES in 1994. The song that we're gonna listen to is Gangplank Galleon, and it's by David Wise. Uh, The soundtrack itself is also by Evelyn Novakovic, who some may remember as uh, Evelyn Fisher, and also Robin Beanland. So let's give it a listen.
welcome back. That was Donkey Kong Country on the Super NES that came out in 1994. The track that we just heard was Gangplank Galleon, and it's by David Wise, with the soundtrack support by Evelyn Novakovic and Robin Beanland. Yes. Ah, uh, man, <laughs> where do I start? So many questions. At the beginning, because <laughs> the, the, the song has has some distinct parts. Like, the, the opening to the to this track is mm. obviously very different than the rest of it. Yes. Uh, and I like both parts of the track for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Like, I love how bouncy and just, like, silly the opening is. I got Swedish pirate ship. <laughs> That's that's what I heard. <laughs> that 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 I'll I'll have to write that down. And remember that, that that's fairly accurate. Yeah, yeah. And then it just uh, like you you point out when the, the like the strings come in or the the, the keys come in, it, it it's got the sinister overtone. Yeah. Uh, and then it just turns into like this almost like semi military esque. Yeah, I mean it's a rocker. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Uh, it, it turns into this like really grandiose rocker that I, I don't know if I would say it's galloping. I guess maybe galloping a do 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 do. It's it's almost gallop. Yeah, yeah. It's almost a gallop. But the harmonized parts of the mel- of the lead melodies really really uh, get me. Yeah, it's it's just <laughs> that's I've said this time and time again on the podcast. That's where that's where you can hook me in a song is harmonized. Oh, like different yeah. octaves. Yeah. That's just, I love it. I love it. So this soundtrack, a lot of songs were actually done by Evelyn. And I believe one song was done by Robin. Is that right? That was the uh, Funky Kong yeah, song? Yeah, I, I, I took Robin's, um, he had a track from Killer Instinct, which he was working on at the time. Mm-hmm. So um, he gave me some of the samples that he'd done because we had very little sample space. Mm-hmm. And so I converted it to run on the uh, Super NES. So mm-hmm. yes, it was fortunately donated by Robin. <laughs> What was it like working on the Super NES with multiple composers all at once? Was that a, a challenge? Uh, Evelyn was fairly new to the company, so I was basically training her up to do the stuff on the SNES at the time. Mm-hmm. So, so so she contributed um, almost half of the soundtrack, I believe. I'm not quite sure, but it was around 40% of it. So I was helping with the SNES. Because if you've been, if you've come from a background where you're using keyboards and a, and a digital audio workstation however however early and then you've got to actually type the thing in because we're typing this all in hex Mm -hmm. oh yeah all machine code it was very difficult and so i was helping her with the learning the programming and i I did the same with grant for the i don't know he converted dkc2 yeah yeah Yeah, which we're going to get into one of grant's first jobs when he got there yeah it was my first job yeah Yeah, absolutely and it's quite a job uh taking music turning it into code and still making it sound musical so yeah. that was uh, that, that's where we started with Evelyn okay so when you were writing music for Donkey Kong Country for the first one what was kind of your inspiration because the Donkey Kong games in general didn't really have that much music i mean there was that tune that you in, in, kind of incorporated in the opening mm-hmm. uh, of yes. the game but other than that, it didn't really have that much music. So where, where were you drawing inspiration from? Um, everything I was listening to at the time. Uh, when we first saw it, it was basically a, a jungle. So I went and listened to every single tune. I, I can remember listening to Girl is in the Mist and um, hmm. many, many jungly type things. Tarzan, there was a lot of Tarzan and for, for inspiration. So I was just pulling in all these different bits from so many companies. Hmm and um, composers just trying to mangle something together that sounded jungly. Yeah. <laughs> now, I know that Grant has uh, quite a bit of inspiration from, uh, like, metal, like heavy metal, stuff like Queen's Rock we talked about on <laughs> last episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got the devil horns. What, like, mainstream music would you say that you were well, invested the- in? that maybe influence this particular track since it's more of a it's got that heavier tone to it well specifically at the end um the week before i wrote it i'd been down to london at a um it's like a, a specialist recording thing and uh, one of the companies there they were demonstrating it was probably jackson guitars or something like that and so there was a very intimate stage for about 150 people and onto the stage came most divine maiden oh, <laughs> and- yes and they were demonstrating, uh, and we got the drummer Nick Owen McBain and uh, the bass player and the guitarist, and mm-hmm. they were they're doing it as a three piece. So it had a very intimate kind of demonstration of the sort of stuff that they did. So it's literally because I've been listening to Iron Maiden about a week before I wrote it. Yeah. They, they had quite a, uh, a bit of an effect on the influence of that track. <laughs> That's really cool. Ding, 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 ding. ding. Yeah, run, run to the hills, right? Run to the hills. Yeah, it? run to the hills. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah. That's. So, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Iron Maiden's my favorite band, so that 
that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. And now we know where that like pseudo gallop is and the uh, the different harmonies yeah. kind of joined together. That that's, that makes sense. That's really cool. Yeah. That's neat. And the, the, the first part of Gamma Gano, I think it's part of the bigger tune. There's a there's just uh, I haven't haven't listened to the soundtrack in full since I finished it. Mm. I think the, there is a tune for Gangplat Galleon that doesn't have the, the bit, because that was used for the boss, but it kind of transitions, doesn't it? Right. So there's a whole arrangement of just the pirate type thing. Oh, okay. Hmm. Just because um, Tim's quite into Tim, who ran Rare. He was very much into pirates at the time, so <laughs> <laughs> pirate music. <laughs> and that makes sense, too, for uh, Donkey Kong Country 2, yep. which is our next game that we'll be talking about, uh, yeah. because that was entirely pirate-themed. I mean, the very first level, you're on a pirate ship, and you're kind of on... An, <laughs> the island is different, because in Donkey Kong Country 1, the, you're, you're on a different island than you are in Donkey Kong Country 2. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course, the plot of the first game is all your bananas get taken, you're playing as Donkey <laughs> Kong and Diddy Kong, and you got to rescue all your bananas and defeat the evil King... K. K. Rule. Rule. Yes. The the Gangplat Galleon theme was used by um, in Smash, wasn't it? They did a Mariachi version I, of it. I believe so. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. That's really cool. Let's move into our next track, uh, which is Donkey Kong Country Two, Diddy's Conquest, the official title. This song that I'm about to play, <laughs> I don't want to use a double negative here, but I'm gonna anyways. I can't not interview David Wise and not play. <laughs> <laughs> Sticker Bush Symphony, Symphony, also known as Bramble Blast. Hmm. Uh, that's on the Super NES in 1995, and that's a track we're going to listen to, and it's by David Wise. Thank you. 
welcome back to XVGM Radio. That was the best song ever, Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest, uh, Super NES release that came out in 1995. That was Sticker Bush Symphony Bramble Blast. Now, I read on Twitter that is, according to you, David, that is the official name, not Sticker Brush, not Bramble Blast. That is apparently Sticker Bush Symphony Bramble Blast. Is that accurate? Yeah, there were two levels. One was called Sticker Bush Sym- Symphony and Bramble Blast. So whichever, um, we, we use the tunes in multiple levels. So okay. that, that's why there's two names for it. But gotcha. it, either way, it's fine. Ooh. Yeah. Hmm. So I have many, many questions, but I'm going to try to tone down my fanboyism. Uh, because if, let me think, I was, it was 95. Mm-hmm. So I was 12. Wow. Well, yeah. I was 12 years old when this game came out. Right? Yeah, we were 12. Yeah. Yeah. So if I to- if I went back in time and told twelve year old Mike that thirty seven year old Mike uh, is interviewing David Wise and Grant Kirko, his head would have exploded. So this song, it's probably my favorite on the soundtrack. As with many many people, for whatever reason, this particular song. I mean, it's a well composed song. I was curious because I've dived deep into the realm of electronic music and I've tried to talk about this song with maybe you and maybe other people before Mm. trying to nail down what type of genre music this is. I always considered it uh, what they call either dream house or dream trance, Hmm. uh, which is where you have uh, like pianos. One really good example of a really popular song from the 90s was, um, I believe it was Robert Miles' Children. If you've ever heard that song, I don't know if anybody's heard that song, but it's basically where you've got like a backbeat, you know, like like in this song, the that, and then you've got the piano overlaid on top of it, very like bright piano, ambient piano. So, would you say that that is an accurate representation of genre when it comes to the song, David? I have no idea. I've not really listened to that genre at all. No. Just while you were talking about it, it reminded me a bit of someone like Crowded House, but. Okay. With it being quite ambient. <laughs> but no, it, it was never meant to be uh, fall into a genre. It, it mm. was just video game music. Mm-hmm. And that's the type of music that you can make when you're trying to squeeze every last <laughs> uh, bite out of a, a very compromised system. Right, right. System. Uh, g- g- going back to, to um, whenever it was, 1994, the, the system only had 64K of memory. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And there was, we we're still typing in hex numbers. There was no MIDI, so it was a case of this is how much memory we've got, and this is what we can do with it. Mm-hmm. And that was the the genre. So the the actual music was made to the constraints of the system, rather than an, any other way around, really. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So it, it wasn't necessarily influenced by the genre that you just mentioned at all, because I hadn't heard of it till today. Right. <laughs> okay, then. Well, that settles it. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, it, it might be, based on its composition, it might fall into that uh, that, that genre, but it, do, it doesn't sound like it was composed with that in mind. Right, with that intention. Huh. Okay, well then, I'm I'm happy. Yeah. My my an- my question <laughs> my question has been answered. I've always wondered that because I knew about that electronic music that subgenre, yeah, yeah. and I was always like, oh man. And it's funny because uh, it also kind of has like a new age kind of vibe to it yeah uh of like new age type music it's, it's very flowy enya enya yep. i was gonna say enya that that song that's like oh yeah ha. or noko flow no, no. that's the sail away one no, i was listening to the great influence it was trevor horn okay so it was a, an album of his that brendan gunn had had lent me and it was it was all all the remixes that trevor horn had done okay for some of his artists and uh, that was probably the, the biggest influence on that particular track one song that I've always wondered about as well is the areas where like uh, it's like the crystal mines kind of there's oh. there's these background vocals that sound like Michael Jackson almost. It's like a sound effect but it also sounds like a vocal probably one of our monkey sound effects which means that it's Mark Betteridge on the vocal there. Oh uh, really? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So it it would have just been some modified vocals from Mark because he came in and he did all the monkey sound effects for us. Uh, it was the mining Very level, good. mining sounds. melancholy, I believe, is the name of the song. Okay. That that background that it sounds like someone going. Dot. No, no, it's all coincidental. It's all metallic there. Really. Have the memory for it there. It, it's completely. Yeah, um, I don't hear what you're talking about. That's interesting. 
Okay. I can hear I can hear what you're saying, but it's just the harmonic frequency in, in the sound oh, wow. breaking up because of the it was a four bit sample that had been resampled to sixteen bit and it's anti lasing and that gives it that effect. Oh, oh that's interesting. That's that's really cool. I yeah. never would have even imagined that. Yeah. Huh. It's uh I don't know. There's parts of, of this this is my favorite of the two games, even though the first game meant a lot more to me like on yeah. an emotional level. Like this game I think was the better of the two games personally. Mm -hmm. This is the game where you play as Diddy Kong and his, I don't know, sister slash love interest, Dixie Kong. Oh, oh. <laughs> I think it's his girlfriend, like, officially. Yeah, I yeah. know I say that all the time, but I think it's his actual girlfriend. And they're rescuing Donkey Kong from the clutches of Captain K. Rule. Yeah. Now, he's he's been upgraded from a king to a captain. I, I, feel, I feel like that's a downgrade, downgrade isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, that makes sense, because he gets defeated in the yeah. first one. It's like, where can you go from there, you know? I figure what we'll do is we'll compare this version with the version that Grant worked on. Because Grant worked on Donkey Kong Land 2. The Game Boy game. Right, the Game Boy game. So we're going to play that. This is an arrangement of Sticker Brush Symphony.
All right, welcome back. That was Donkey Kong Land 2, the Game Boy game that came out in 1996. This was Grant's arrangement of David's Sticker Bush Symphony Bramble Blast from Donkey Kong Country 2 on the SNES. That's right. Grant mentioned earlier that uh, his first job was doing this soundtrack or this arrangement of the soundtrack. So what was it like, uh, Grant, working with the Game Boy and David's tunes? Like, did you both kind of work hand in hand together or was David kind of just like, here's the music, like, this is what you need to do with it? Uh, Because at that point you were still learning. It was great working with David's tunes because I I love that that, that soundtrack. It's a great soundtrack. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was super hard doing it on the Game Boy because I'd only worked in, like, you know, MIDI files and Cubase and the first day I got there, Dave came and said, but you know, I did the Game Boy today. And I was like, all oh, right. And he showed me how it worked really quickly, you know, like, because it was really easy for him. And I was like, oh, my God, what is this? It was just like, you know, all in hex. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, I remember calling Robin after the first day at Rare and saying, I'm going to have to quit because I just, I'm not clever enough to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, look, just got to get Dave back tomorrow and tell him to show you again, but a bit more slowly. Because like, <laughs> Dave's really good at it and I was hopeless at it, right? Right. And so I, I, I said, I rang Dave next day. I said, Dave, can you come back and just, just show me one more time, you know? <laughs> uh, and um, I remember writing, I, said, I, got a, I got a little notepad. I wrote down every step, like, you know, step one, you know, press alt four, whatever it was, step two. And I wrote it down in a massive list of how to do it. And that's how I managed it in the end. I found it so hard. <laughs> uh, to, to be fair, I thought you, you learned really, really quickly. Oh, I thought no, it was going to take. I can't believe it. I felt like I was hopeless that day. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I really thought after his eyes, I said, bloody hell, it's just too hard. I can't believe how hard it is, you know. But at the end of it, I did really, I enjoyed it in the end because I think, I guess like Dave, you, you try and squeeze out of what you can, don't you? So I think it's, you it's a bit of a problem solving thing in the end. You, you kind of, you know, do your best, you know. And I really like the soundtracks. I really like doing it. But yeah, those first few days were a bit, were a bit tricky. First of all, So uh, I know David had composed soundtracks for other Game Boy games like the Battletoads Game Boy games and uh, I think if I recall I remember hearing that there was a whole third Battletoads game or something like that that they that you guys were working on that was ready to go I think it was Kevin I think his name's Kevin Bayless was talking about it could be yeah um, I, yeah I can't remember yeah it's a long time ago now of course yeah so regarding Donkey Kong Land, whose decision was it to make like a Game Boy version? Was it the Nintendo came and approached you guys and was like, hey, we want to have you guys do like a, a portable version of the same game? Yeah, it would have been Nintendo. And mm-hmm. um, so we, we needed one doing. Obviously, they take quite a while when you're typing it in. So Grant got the short straw there, and that was his first project. <laughs> and completely in the, the deep end. Yeah. What was it? Uh, what would you say it was like working with uh, Nintendo back then? Especially for for Grant, you were just kind of stepping in. So not only are you working for Rare, but you're also technically sort of working for Nintendo since it's their franchise and everything. What was it like as far as uh, as that as that goes? Did you guys have any involvement with them? Well, Rare kept us pretty much. They were good at shield, what it, like a shield. So we never really, I never really dealt with anybody at Nintendo. Okay. Ever at the time I was there, yeah. and I think they, you know, Tim and Chris used to keep us you know, protected from that. So when Nintendo were having a real rant and rave about the games being late, we never really knew about it. They, just, they took all the heat and we never got, we never knew, did we? So we just went, we yeah. were like, happy yeah. jolling along, you know, not realising. They were going, where's this game? Where's this, you know, like yeah. that. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. We, we didn't realize. I think that the only time we'd have dealt with Nintendo would have been long after we left Rare. Yeah. Right. We dealt with them directly. Yeah. Because you yeah. were both at that point in time uh, freelancing, so you were doing separate games. I know uh, David yeah. did uh, Tropical Freeze, Donkey Kong Country yep. Returns, and uh, Grant did uh, the Mario uh, Rabbids game, the strategy. Oh, it's yeah, kind of like yeah. XCOM, that game. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. 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 Really cool. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, get into our next track. Coincidentally, it is Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. What a good segue. Yeah, this came out on the Wii U and the Switch. And this was a track called Zipline Shrine. And it's by David Wise and uh, also credited for the soundtrack as Kenji Yamamoto. Thank you. 
All right, you are back, and that was Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, or Donkey Kong Country Returns mm. Tropical Freeze, if you want to be technical. And that came out on the Wii U and the Switch in 2014 and 2018, respectively. That track was Zip Line Shrine. Uh, it's also known as Jungle Jitters, and that was by David Wise with support by Kenji Yamamoto. We've talked about Kenji Yamamoto before on mm-hmm. the show, uh, mostly a Metroid composer That's working right, yep. a lot with the metroid series metroid prime Primes, yep super metroid did sound program and sound effects on uh, mike tyson's punch out was his first game hey pikmin was the last game he worked on in 2017 that was mm. sound progress management hmm. and composing wise he's mostly been doing like arrangements and mm-hmm. uh sound direction but uh composing wise it looks like his last game was uh excite bots oh, okay. i believe he was the music chief but yeah. Anyways, so this music is so much more advanced sounding. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we jumped from the SNES. We jumped to the, twenty years. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there's definitely going to be a, a bit of that. It, it still has the same feel, like the Donkey Kong Country feel that the other so, uh, that the other tracks have. Yeah. But obviously amped way way up. Like mm-hmm. the, the the drums and everything else in this is, is a lot more bombastic. Mm-hmm. So we we were talking about the plot of the game during the break because. I assume, as I haven't played this one, but I assume that like the whole forest gets frozen over and whatnot. Yeah, and you can kind of hear that in the music with a lot of those like those higher pitched and like tinny or or um, almost metallic uh, no- sounds that are being used as percussion. In there. Yeah, sure. And it just it it always reminds me of like an ice level in a game when you hear uh, when you hear a lot of that stuff. So mm-hmm. uh, I thought it was a, kind of a felt like a nice nod to the frozen forest. Personally, the thing that I was missing from Donkey Kong Country Returns, aside from the fact that I wasn't a big fan of the motion controls, they oh. they remade the game for the 3DS, yeah, and it's yeah. like way, way better because it's it's you've just got the physical controls, the controller in your hand, and it just it feels tighter and it plays a little better. Yeah. And it's basically the same experience. But musically, I always felt like it was more of a nod to Donkey Kong Country mm. and less of a sequel to Donkey Kong Country. And a lot of that has to do with the atmosphere and the music of the game. I think they got the vibe right yeah. at our Retro Studios, but I feel like this was the Donkey Kong Country 4 that I always wanted. Uh, you know what I mean? Yep. And a large part of that is because David came back. Did so he, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, my, I guess my first question to you, David, for that one is how did you come into working on Tropical Freeze? Because at that point you were freelancing. So did Nintendo approach you or did you approach Nintendo? To be honest, I think it's a a combination of things. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, Basically, Nintendo approached me, Mm -hmm. as far as I know, but there are are a few stakeholders in in, in that. So it's probably more complicated, but I won't bore you with the details. (laughs) Yeah, but... Nintendo uh, approached me around the time that they were doing um, Donkey Kong Country Returns, but because of contractual stuff, uh, it, it wasn't the right time to get involved. So mm-hmm. I, I was probably talking to them at that time, and it took a couple of years before we, we joined all the dots and started working on Tropical Freeze. Were you working directly with Kenji Yamamoto on this, or how, is, how did um, that work? Uh, I went over to Austin, over to Retro Studios quite a few times, and um, well, we used to have meetings over there and i met uh, kenji a couple of times and he was uh, more in the producing type role of making sure that we had all the assets that we needed to proceed he certainly um joined in with the guitar parts or some of the guitar parts and also his the, the big one that he did there's um there's a savannah type level with lots of vocals in and we i'd originally taken the samples from it's called Heart of Africa, and hmm. used those as inspiration. But we, could, we didn't want to use those, so he'd arranged for the, the, they've got like this big choir over at Nintendo. So he'd arranged for them to come in, hmm. and they placed all the vocals with the Japanese choir, and it just uh, it just gives it a whole different vibe. But yeah, for it, sure, it sounded awesome. So he, he was he was very involved, but in the background. That's cool. What was it like working on a Donkey Kong Country game like all those years later? Because going from, I think it was na- probably around what two thousand like three or four ish for Donkey Kong uh, yeah, advanced. It was, uh, it was great. It was uh, again. You find with software companies always full of decent people who are just very passionate about making great video games. Mm-hmm. So it was like working at Rare with them. Um, uh, you know, a great bunch of people who were just trying to get the best game possible. So it was very, there's a lot of parallels really. And because we'd worked for Nintendo before, it seemed very similar just to uh, go and slot in there. 
for and sure. Obviously, it was nice to work for the Donkey Kong franchise. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It, it was nice at that point to um, be approached by Nintendo to, to go and do their Donkey Kong game. So I was, you know, very, very, very happy about that. Cool. What would you say as far as musically that you, when you were brought back in to do this soundtrack that you wanted to bring uh, as on a, on a musical perspective? Because... Uh, yeah, on, on a musical level, the uh, when we were working on the Super NES, we only had eight monophonic channels and 64K of memory. So there are many, many things that I wanted to do back when we were doing DKC2, DKC3 that mm-hmm. just physically wasn't possible. Mm-hmm. So it was nice to come back using a huge amount of processing and there really were very few limits as to what we could do. Right. And it was nice to have that freedom. So it was, it was great stuff to be able to do that. Very cool. Yeah. So, Justin, I believe you have a song that you would like to pick and ask David a question about. Uh, What song is that? Yeah, so while we're in the Donkey Kong era, this is Diddy Kong Racing on the N64. This came out in 1997, and the track is The Secret Tune by David Wise. Back to XVGM Radio's ukulele episode with David Wise and Grant Kirkhope. That was Diddy Kong Racing, which came out on the Nintendo 64 in 1997. The track was The Secret Tune, and it was by David Wise. Uh, the, the, the secret tune where that came from is that I'd written a tune for Diddy Kong Racing that was going to be used for the, one of the water levels, and we didn't feel that it fitted, so that's why it's a secret tune. So I went and wrote a different tune altogether for the same level, and it just meant that we had one over okay. at the end of the product. So that became the secret tune. You know, I actually was going to ask him about TT's theme. <laughs> we played uh, on yeah. a previous episode. We played uh, TT's theme, which is like the options music. Yeah. Uh, and uh, was that? I, I'm assuming that was inspired by Celebration. Yeah. Yes, it, it was. Okay. Um, uh, uh, I don't know who wrote Celebration, but they're a great band. Yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah. it was definitely inspired and in, influenced. So. <laughs> who uh, who did the... Do you know who happened to know who did the voice for TT? Yes, it was a, a guy called Dean Smith. So he, he, pro- he provided that voice. Okay. So, um, he also did quite a few of the other voices. He was, he was very on board with it. And um, it was just too much of an opportunity not to do the, the TT music <laughs> and that kind of style. <laughs> it was so good, though. Yeah. Very fun. Yeah, it was really hilarious. So, Justin, you got a pick from a banjo game because now we're moving on to Grant's track. So what do we got coming up? All right. So this is going to be from Banjo-Kazooie on the N64. This was the 1998 release Secret Fanfare 4 Mad Monster Mansion uh, by Grant Kirkhope.
Okay, th welcome back. That was Banjo-Kazooie on the N64 in 1998. Secret Fanfare 4, Mad Monster Mansion was the name of the track by Grant Kirkhope. So Grant, when it comes to Banjo-Kazooie and your kind of movement over from the Donkey Kong Land 2 over to, I think at this, you, you were done with GoldenEye at that point, and this is pre-Perfect Dark. So were you working on Banjo-Kazooie while you were working on anything else? Uh, no. So at that point, I'd, I'd, I'd stopped GoldenEye, and I'd started working on Banjo-Kazooie. It was a, a weird thing, really, because I was working on GoldenEye, and one day... Uh, Tim Stamper and this young guy, I didn't know who he was, uh, came to visit me in my little office at Rare. And uh, the little the young guy sat in the chair and Tim sat on the floor. And I was like, oh my God, if Tim sat on the floor, who's this young guy sat in the chair? I thought I didn't, I thought it was some, you know, my God, he must be somebody really important. You know, yeah. I didn't know who he was. And they just sort of said, yes, give us play as your golden eye change, please. And I sort of went through them and they were very quiet. Mm. And I thought, oh, God, I'm going to get fired. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's crap, you know. Mm. Um, so, uh, and, and see, oh, that's fine. Yeah. So, so we were working on um, a game of Dream and we'd like to come and join Dave on Dream. I was like, oh, uh, oh, because that was like, at that point, that was a big game at the company. I was like, oh my God, this is like, you know. So, oh yeah, look, uh, you know, when I finish GoldenEye, I'll, I'll be able to. He said, no, 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 GoldenEye's finished right now. You're working on Dream from now. And that was it. Pack up your stuff. Hmm. Come and move to come and move into the other block. So I did that. So that was a bit of a shock. I was like, oh my God, you know. So um, off I went. Hmm. And then Dave got, got moved on to do uh, Diddy Kong Racing. And then Dream turned into Banjo Kazooie. And that, that's what it became my game. So. Um, that was the first game that I did all the music and all the sound effects on. Okay, okay. Very cool. So so then, I mean, that, that just means that th this track was even more all you than it, than anything else, because, I mean, if, if usually if, if other people are doing sound effects and you're including sound effects into the track, uh, I don't know how that works, but knowing that, like, you did the sound effects and the music, like, this this track has all, like, the little goofy laughter and all that other uh, all that other stuff in there. That's, that's uh, I, I don't know, that, that just stands out as, as an even higher level of... <laughs> composition somehow so those laughs and, and all that was that you or were those the voice actors who were in the the game playing like banjo and playing like gruntilda, uh, gruntilda? Uh, no that was all samples so like we had a big sample library uh, at rare at the time uh, back in the old days then you they were just all on cds and we had like you know, hundreds of cds hmm. and the only way you could find what was on them was a massive catalog that was like this thick oh, which is like several of those catalogs and so you just literally had to it was such a laborious task to find sound effects you just have to get a you have to go and you get the book out and you go through it and look for laughs or whatever <laughs> and if you like cd 45 indent track 15 so then you have to go and ring wraps find the cd if you couldn't find it ring the rest of the composer says anyone got cd whatever it is and say i've got it you get the cd hmm. bring it back to you put it in a cd player listen to it and go oh, i don't like it start again find another oh. cd the long, 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 slow process. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't until later, the, later we had like a sound effects search engine that was built and we had a, all the CDs sat on a, a server in Rare. We could type in an, 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 a word like, you know, fart and it would list off all the farts <laughs> and, go, and you could click through and listen to the farts and download it to your PC as much faster. But that was like, in the early days at Rare, it was like, find a CD, listen to it, not like it, find another one, take you hours. That's what this song is missing. Fart Farts? sound effects. Oh, Can you just <laughs> picture like the, the laugh and then the pfft, just... Oh my god. <laughs> so goofy <laughs> oh man but that's this game though this yeah, game no, is, it is very fun and very goofy and it's very clearly a direct inspiration for for ukulele oh yeah both I mean, musically and uh in, and so, gameplay so, yeah i was gonna say yeah. somewhat visually like you've got the, the the character that has wings and the character that doesn't have wings yeah and they, they they pair up exactly it's very cool yeah all right let's move into our next track for uh banjo tooie right yep and this is another one for me so banjo tooie came out in the n64 in 2000 this is Wild West Zone by Grant Kirkup. Thank you. 
Welcome back. That was Wild West Zone from Banjo Tooie, which came out on the N64 in 2000 and was composed by Grant Kirkhope. I think I've talked about this before. I, I'm a sucker for Wild West things, even though I'm not really that big into Wild West movies. Okay. I like Wild West stories and I like Wild West games like Red Dead Redemption, Red Dead Redemption 2 and whatnot. Yeah. And particularly when games have a Wild West level like Buster Bust Loose has right. the, uh, the Montana Max levels. <laughs> So having a Wild West level in this game, of course, one of my favorite things. And it doesn't feel like there's a lot to the song. Like, it's very much just that guitar um, mm-hmm. and then sort of the sound effects of the birds and the wind. But, like, it's so simple and it feels so Western that it ha- really helps with the stage and I really love it. Yeah, so I guess for me, in my age, that, you know, the big spaghetti Westerns with Clint yep. Eastwood, you know, that you know, kind of thing, uh, you mm-hmm. know, for a few dollars more and the good, the bad and the ugly. Yep, yep. You know, I love the way that the way the, the music sounds, you know, um, you know, the Sergio Leone who directed him fantastically well and, you know, it's just the, the soundtrack by, oh God, I've completely forgotten his name. Ennio uh, Moroni yes, or Morricone, something? Yes, of course, yes, Mr. God, I can't believe I forgot that. Yes, Mr. Morricone, of course, it's a <laughs> uh, Yeah, so like, I feel like those soundtracks that movies are so iconic that you can't that is the wild west like yep yeah you know, Marconi just created the wild west and far as i'm concerned in the music because it was so atmospheric really simple a lot of the time you know the bit where the just the little music box plays as they're about to start the gunfight and all that yep. stuff is just so perfect so that, so i was just trying my best to get some of that stuff into that particular part of that level mm-hmm. you know because it's so brilliant and also that whole entire level was one of my favorites because that's when Will Bryan, who was a, the lead program on Banjo Tooie, he um, managed to stick two MIDI files together. So I had 32 channels as opposed to 16 channels. Oh, so yeah. that meant that I could have more instruments. So it meant that I could have one MIDI file that would cover all the areas. So it never restarts. So, like I'm in Grunton's Lair, it morphs to different versions of the tune as you wander about, but sometimes you've got to restart it because I've got no, I'm not got enough channels to cover all the areas. Mm-hmm. But in this particular one, because I had 32 channels, I had enough channels to cover all the, it was like five areas whatever, in that in that level, whatever it was. So, so, no matter where you go, it never restarts. It just, it just, it just picks another set of instruments to play, so it completely morphs. So, that was like our kind of crowning achievement with that kind of a you know, MIDI channel fake thing. Hmm. Well, that's really in, the cool. reviews, in the reviews, no one mentioned it. So I was kind of like, you know, we really tried super hard to make that work and then no one even noticed it. It was like, oh, right, great. Mm. Um, but <laughs> yeah, but that was that was the kind of cra- the, our crowning achievement in that MIDI channel fade thing. That's really cool. That, yeah, that's really nice. Mm. And uh, you mentioned like the music box, right? As like a shootout starts. It's funny because that's sort of what I imagine with this. Like this feels like a lot of the iconic cowboy movies. And like the only sound you hear is like that sad guitar. And then the people step out and you know right. draw and get, get ready to, <laughs> yeah. uh, to have a gunfight. So yeah, yeah. I, I think you I got totally, it spot on. I totally, yeah, I totally stole that from Mr. Morricone. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's completely stolen, not mine. Yeah. <laughs> it was well used then. I feel like it's yeah. more Western than spaghetti Western, though. But there's a lot more horn instrumentation. Oh. Uh, there's a lot more of that. And in this, there's less of that. But mm-hmm. I I do think you're right, though, that it it's definitely that moment where everyone's going away back in their houses yep, when yep. there's about to be a showdown. Like closing that, the shutters. Yeah, 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 yeah. This this fits that for sure. Yep. Yeah. Compared to, to GoldenEye, of course, finishing GoldenEye and then immediately jumping on Banjo-Kazooie, was that a challenge to kind of shift gears because you're going from like a much more spy, action-y, you know, fast-paced game to a more like relaxed, chill kind of vibe with this music that's a little more like sunny day, kid friendly. Mm-hmm. Was was there a challenge to go back and forth on that? You know what, not really. I think I think, you know, we like to call ourselves media composers these days. Mm-hmm. And I think you just are expected to write anything that anybody asks you to do. Mm. So I think even then even though I was just starting it rare back then, I think you just got used to the fact that you just got you had to write what the guy asked you to write and that mm-hmm. was it. It was you know, it was a nine to five job. You worked down nine to five, you know, day in, day out and that was it. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I do feel like that's something you just get used to doing. I'm still doing the same thing these days. You know, if it's my rabbits or if it's whatever or civilization or whatever, you know, you, just, you change your gears to work on the thing that's coming, you know. So mm-hmm. I think you have to be very versatile to work in the industry these days because people can ask you for anything. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. They may like what you've written in the past. Mm-hmm. They may love Banjo Kazooie, but they say, well, yeah, but what you to write this is now? And it's like nothing to do with Banjo Kazooie. Right. So, right. you know, you do get asked anything, especially like games like Viva Pinata when it was like other oh, advanced dances. Every romance dance is in a different kind of style of music. So there was in the first game, there's like 65 animals. So that that was 65 20 second snippets of different kind of music, from like Duran Duran sound into you know ballroom dancing to Beatles hippie to you, you know every single kind of genre was covered in those romance dances. I had to write 20 seconds of it, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's really good fun to do. 
and it's challenging too. So you just get used to doing it, right? So I feel like that's just the way it goes. And also, I think Band Kazooie was a, that was my first game I did by myself, completely on my own, you know, all, as I say, all, all the music, all the sound effects. And so I remember, because Diddy Kong Racing was going and they said it's daft having Dave and Grant on the same game, Dave should go and do Diddy Kong Racing, Grant could stay and do Band Kazooie. And I remember Tim Stamper coming to see me and saying to me, right, this game's completely yours, you know. He said to me, don't f*** it up. Yeah, <laughs> All right, so let's move into the next track. This is jumping ahead eight years mm -hmm. to Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, which came out on the Xbox 360. <laughs> Moving over to Microsoft now. Mm -hmm. And that came out in 2008. The track we're going to play is Out Around Nutty Acres, and it's by Grant Kirkhope with soundtrack support by Robin Beanland and David Klinick.
listening to XVGM Radio. Hey, you are back to XVGM Radio, and that track that we just heard was Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, which came out in the Xbox 360 in 2008, and the song Out Around Nutty Acres was what we just heard by Grant Kirkhope, and I gotta say, it's a refreshing vibe that kind of comes back from the original like Banjo Kazooie Banjo Tooie games, yeah, and to hear it kind of revitalized with like newer music and like it definitely feels like a fresh coat of paint, yeah, music it, wise. It sounds cleaner. Yeah, like the production on it. Were you using similar types of equipment, but just like slightly better, or were you using brand new equipment that you'd never used before on previous Banjo games? So. It's not so much the equipment, it's, it's just we had more memory space. It was a proper CD soundtrack at that point, mm-hmm. right? So most of Nuts and Bolts, when nearly all of it, is, is completely live orchestra. We recorded it in Prague with the City of Prague Philharmonic Orchestra. Uh-huh. So that's anything like that is, in the game, is it's all live orchestra. But that track, funny you picked that track, because that is all samples, that track. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, then. Uh, so the because one. I wrote it um, very early on, and for some reason decided not to record it with orchestra because it had too many bits in it that weren't orchestral. You know, there's steel drums, there's a bit of electric guitar at the end of it and bits and pieces. So we actually got the guy that mixed the orchestral soundtrack to mix that piece so it kind of matched the mix of the orchestra. Okay. But it's all samples. Oh, wow. So like, you know, probably using the similar sample libraries to, to the ones that I used back in the early days, but you could use it properly. You didn't have to take a, you didn't sample one note and that's a, you only had one clarinet note to use to cover the entire keyboard. Right. Now you've got a sample library with the clarinet sampled multiple times, every single note sampled them, you know, different velocities, different different volumes, all, all that kind of thing. You know? So hmm. it's it was real live players in the samples you were using, you were still playing on a keyboard as opposed to somebody playing it for you. So I mean, we had more space to do it, you know, we could, we could you know, it was a proper, se- like a stereo wave by that, by that point. Right. So just a little bit of information about the games for the Banjo series. Uh, in Banjo-Kazooie, you play as Banjo, who is a male bear, and Kazooie, who is a female bird. You're facing off against Gruntilda in Banjo-Kazooie, who uh, steals Banjo's sister to steal her beauty, because uh, Gruntilda is this evil, green, gross-looking witch. Right. So you defeat her in the sequel, Banjo-Tooie, which we just heard uh, right before we played this Nuts and Bolts track. You are playing again as Banjo-Kazooie to take on Gruntilda and her uh, Her two two sisters. sisters, Yes. Right, right. In Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, you are again playing as Banjo-Kazooie, but in this game, there's like cars, construction of vehicles and stuff. And so you can make like uh, different cars, bikes, boats, airplanes, that sort of thing. Was any of that when they were changing the type of gameplay? Was did you take any of that into consideration when making the music for this game in particular, or or was it more like just stick with the format of like that banjo style? Um, well, I guess you know the music changed quite a bit because it went went full orchestral, so that was different about mm-hmm. it. You know, I felt the game was a different game. You know, Nuts and Bolts gets a bit of a hard a hard rap some a lot, a lot of times these days. People feel, people don't like it. I think about this Bulls is a really good game, but I just feel like it should have maybe not have been Banjo Kazooie in it. Yeah, I think it had a great mechanic. I mean, it, it kind of predates Minecraft as the things you can just build. You can just build any vehicle you want with as many engines as you want and crazy things and make it work. It's like a, it's a real, you know, make something and use it game. You know, it's, yeah. it's a really, really cool mechanic. But I guess you know people wanted to want the characters back as they were. Mm-hmm. They didn't like the fact that it was a banjo game that wasn't really like a banjo game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I guess there was that. But I mean, you know, also, you know, rare. With, even back in those days, Rare was always a very forward-looking company. They didn't want to go back to things. They didn't like to go back and revisit things too many times. Sure. They didn't like doing sequels, really. It got less and less as time went on with Rare to do a sequel. You might have got one sequel and that was it. It wouldn't go any further. You know? I think that was a big deal. I think also, you know, the company changed hands to Microsoft. Tim and Chris Stamper left. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, things were really changing you know, back at that point in Rare's history. I think it's, only, it's taken Rare really till this point in time to recover, really. It's funny how these things can affect companies, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I feel like Nuts and Bowls got a bit of a bad rap. It's a, it's a really good game to play. It's just, it just probably shouldn't have been advantage of anything. Yeah, a lot of people said that. I've not played this game personally, and I've never really sunk that much more time other than in Banjo-Kazooie as far as like it's actually sitting down and playing the games. Right. But... I enjoyed Banjo-Kazooie for what it was, and from what I heard, it's like, well, if you like Banjo-Kazooie and you like Banjo-Tooie, you may not like Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, which always kind of shocked me because I was like, well, what's different about it? 
you never want to try to make the same game twice. You want to try to make something in the sequels that makes something different. Right, but you, know? you usually want to enhance the gameplay that right. is already there. And yeah. they, I guess it felt like Microsoft had too much changed. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't play this game either. I just, yeah. I've heard plenty of people complain about it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, a lot of the Banjo fans are very vocal about yep. not liking this game. But I've heard the soundtracks before and the music is good. Mm, yeah. So, uh, you know, it gets a buy in for me because if I like the music, uh, <laughs> chances are I'll, I'll typically at least enjoy the game on a very basic level yeah yeah I mean, uh, when a when a game that's not as good has amazing music it kind of puts it at a higher level yeah because you can enjoy it playing the game and you can kind of maybe fall in love with it just for the soundtrack first and then the gameplay afterwards so right right so shortly after this i think you did Viva pinata yep mm -hmm. At this point, you went freelance and you started doing a bunch of different games with all different companies. So it's just interesting to see that you came back to working on with Playtonic. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll talk about that in the next break when we talk about uh, Ukulele, because our next track is from that game. And it's a track called Hybrid Towers. And that's by Grant Kirkhope with sound su soundtrack support by David Wise and Stephen Burke. Hey, you are back, and that was Ukulele, and that track was Hivory Towers, and it was by Grant Kirkhope, and the soundtrack itself was also done by David Wise and Stephen Burke. So I love this song. It's so good. I get like a Fiddler on the Roof vibe from this. Yeah. You know, I get like a very like not polka. It's more like like dun 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 dun. dun, dun. Yep. It's it's got that like dun 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 dun. dun. Like it's it's a very I, like. I can see that on, on some of the some of the fiddler tracks. What what I get like hmm. right sort of right away is uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice. Yes. Oh yeah. That maybe that's what I'm thinking of. I don't know why I'm thinking of Fiddler on the Roof. I have no idea. I don't know, but yeah, Sorcerer's Apprentice definitely for sure. Was that an inspiration for this track? Uh, I think a little bit. I think also I was just trying to kind of write the equivalent Gr Gruntilda's Lair track for the for the for the for the main boss in, in, in ukulele. So it's a similar, you know, Grunty's Lair's. Da, 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 da. It's a six eight, right? Oh, da, yeah, you're right. Okay. Da, 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 and Harry Towers is. Da, 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 mm -hmm. da. So that was me trying to find an equivalence because you know we were trying to hook up ukulele with Banjo Kazooie as, as best we could, sure. but without being too obvious, you know, right? And not not being like a rip off or more like a an inspired by, right? You know? Like so an homage, or that was, so I kind of felt it would be fitting for me to write something 
rhythmically similar to Grunty's Lair for uh, capital B, who's a baddie in ukulele. So that's why it's the, it sounds that way. Um, right. But yes, I, I was thinking, I can understand why you say Source of Prentice, because that's the same thing. And it's the same 6-8. It's the same 6 eight rhythm, isn't it? So um, yeah, that's, I guess it's, it's part of that, yeah. Very cool. So ukulele is Platonic's first game. How did you come to working with them? Did they know that they were going to make ukulele as their first game? So the story goes, it's something like, we always thought, wouldn't it be nice to make another Banta Kazooie-esque game? Mm -hmm. And a few of us thought that. So prior to ukulele, uh, to Platonic forming, some of the members from the original banjo team and me decided to have a serious talk about it. So it was like a secret meeting in a pub near Twycross. (laughs) And they did sort of get a little bit of a demo going on the iPad. It was going to turn it into a new banjo kazooie S game, but we had no time and it kind of just went by the wayside. Mm-hmm. No, if some people were still at Rare, we just couldn't do it. A little bit later than that, Gavin Price, who is the head of Ukulele right now, mm. and I said to him, you know, I've got, I've got quite a decent Twitter following these days. I'm sure we could scare up some money on Kickstarter, maybe. You know, yeah. not, not knowing how crazy it was going to go. But, you know, all credit to Gav for going, you know what, I'm just going to go and do it. I'm going to set this up. I'm going to do it. I mean, if it wasn't for him, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. I mean, most of ukulele was done with maybe a 10 man team. It wasn't until later that they got more people. The bulk of the game was done by a very small group of people. And I sometimes feel like Platonic got a bit of a slagging off a little bit in the early days because everybody who reviewed the game reviewed the game like it was a AAA company doing it with hundreds of people. Right. You know, Platonic was a 10 man indie, indie company, no different than any other indie companies out there that make little games, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of feel like. People judged it slightly harshly because they expected it to be like Banjo Kazooie. That was made by Bloody Rare and lots of people, you know, right, and right. at a different time, you know. Yeah. To make a game of that quality, a, a, that quality 3D game, which is hard to do with that amount of people in that amount of time, is mm. an incredible. Thing. So, yeah, I mean, so it kind of Gav kicked it off and so we're going to launch the Kickstarter and then, you know, it raised like two, three million dollars. I, I mean, absolutely incredible, you know. Who, who, I mean, I, we couldn't believe it. I mean, mm-hmm. I remember the Kickstarter, the first minute it kicked off, you know, and I was clicking refresh, <laughs> seeing if any money came, and it just jumped to like thousands of dollars in about the first part. I was like, this something's broken, this must have gone wrong. You know, <laughs> I just keep clicking it going, this keeps going up and up and up and up. I mean, absolutely unbelievable. So, I mean, yeah. you know, it was super heartwarming that all the Banjo fans got to that company to make the game. That was incredible. Yeah. And it also was a big, you know, a big weight on our shoulders to try and satisfy those people mm-hmm. for the thing that they've been wanting for the last umpteen years, you know? <laughs> so it was all a really crazy, I don't know, I can't describe it. I mean, it's, it's hard to put it into words how, how unbelievable that sensation was when we raised that money and the, the game got made and all the fans got behind it. And like, just, you know, those things happen. It's once in a lifetime, those kind of things. It, yeah. it, was, really, it was really incredible. All right. Yeah. Let's move into our next track. This is your pick. What do you got for us? Yep. So uh, again, from Ukulele, I'm going to play Uphill Battle. Ukulele came out in 2017 on the PS4, the Switch, the Xbox One, and PC. And this was composed, again, by Grant Kirkhope with uh, soundtrack support by David Weiss and Stephen Burke. back that was uphill battle from 2017's ukulele and that was composed by grant kirkhope with support by david wise and stephen burke yes 
That song was a lot of fun. Yes. <laughs> and it obviously a, a boss battle theme. Mm-hmm. But uh, I love later on in the track, like a little bit later on, when you've got those like da 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 the like staircase, the staircase arpeggios, yeah. But overall, just the sounds really do harken back to that banjo era musically. Yeah, this one, I feel like a lot of boss themes tend to be singularly focused or like they don't get very grand. Mm-hmm. The, what I was trying to say is this feels like a very grand boss theme. Like yeah. It's big, it's bombastic. We've used that word a bunch of times, but a lot of this music it just is. Like It feels orchestral. It yeah. feels like there's a lot going on there. I like the rare orchestral boss themes. There's a lot more to unpack and they just feel a lot more fun. Yeah, no, I agree. So when it comes to boss themes for ukulele, especially in comparison with banjo, were you writing in the same sound style or were you trying to incorporate different elements with newer technology? I guess it's the same sound style, really. I guess that's a classic Kirk boss theme, I would, I would have said. Like, <laughs> I do tend to throw the kitchen sink into the boss theme. I just go completely mad, <laughs> always, right? And any boss theme that I do, I always just go over the top. Mm-hmm. I guess I've just done it forever, ever since writing the first boss theme in Banzo Gazillion and, and had one in the second game, Banjo Tui. Mm-hmm. I always just try and go as completely as good as I can write. So whatever my ability is at that point in time, I'll write to my ability to the maximum that I can do it. Mm-hmm. And that's as best I can do. And yeah. I kind of feel like I've got that over the years. I mean, I'm, obviously there's no guarantees, but I feel like I have. So I guess boss themes now for me can get quite elaborate. Like I think that's pretty elaborate. That's got a lot of orchestration in it. Everything's all over the place. And I like to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, like in my Rabbids or any of the games that, you've, that I've mm-hmm. done over the years, I've, I do, or even like Kings of Amla Reckon, I, I, I do sort of pride myself on my boss themes. So I do try super hard to, you know, to make them interesting and elaborate. And it's my attempt to try and capture that amazing stuff that John Williams writes, right? He writes amazing, yeah. <laughs> complicated music. So I'm not saying that I get anywhere near it, but that's my attempt to try and get that ornamentation, that all that stuff that he puts in there. Every second of his music is interesting. Yeah. You know, it's just what's going on. And I, that's, I, I try to do that, especially in the boss themes. I get a Danny Elfman vibe from this as well. Yeah, 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 I was gonna say I, I I have Danny Elfman and John Williams on sort of very very similar shelves. I think I may actually think more highly of Danny Elfman only because I've heard of John Williams my entire life and I feel like he's done he's done so much and he's so acclaimed. I almost want to say he's overrated, but don't say it. So I get what you mean. I didn't say it. Yeah, but um, John Williams, like you can always tell John Williams, he has a very particular sound, and I I don't think I've ever been surprised when someone said, "Oh yeah, this is by John Williams." Um, not that John Williams doesn't have range, I just don't know it. I know Danny Elfman has range because like I know a number of his stuff, the stuff that he's done with uh, Tim Burton, right? The theme song to The Simpsons, mm-hmm. uh, and those are very different things. So Batman the Animated the Series, series. Yep. yeah, yeah. There's a lot to be said there, but like I I also agree with what you're saying like this and some of the stuff from like Banjo Kazooie particularly like the Monster Mansion stuff mm-hmm. uh, has a very Danny Elfman vibe and it's partly because it's a little like on the creepy side and that's also why I like it too sure so, sure like it's all good stuff yeah so this this game you are hunting down pages which are you're going through these magic books and finishing these different like challenges and levels and you're collecting these pages basically the pages are similar to like the music notes in banjo yep. or even in donkey kong country the bananas yeah yeah so you're kind of collecting these to collect them banjo is more of a powerhouse in regards to his character and and like yeah. how he plays in the game and ukulele is a little different like ukulele is like you you do have the flying character with Laylee. But Yuka, he's a lighter character. He's not as like physically powerful as Banjo is, because right. he's you know you're talking a bear versus a chameleon. chameleon. So it's a different size, style. So yeah, so I would imagine that uh, Yuka is more of a like speed or yeah sneaky. Yeah, I would say probably faster. Yeah, yeah. Whereas Banjo's got a little bit more of a waltz, if you will. Yeah. I mean saunter. Yeah, yeah, saunter. A bear saunter. So, all right, let's move on to our next track. This is actually going to be from Yuka, Lele, and the Impossible Lair, which is the spinoff slash sequel mm-hmm. to Yuka, Lele. This came out in 2019 on the Switch, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and the PC. This is Factory Fright. It's by David Wise, and also soundtrack support by Matt Griffin, Grant Kirkhope, and Daniel Murdoch. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, welcome back. That was Ukulele and the Impossible Lair. The track is Factory Fright from the 2019 multi-platform release <laughs> by David Wise. So, David, it sounds like uh, this sample for the background there, it, it's it's got that like that like mining melancholy vibe to it. Uh, would you say that that was what you were going for? That mining melancholy track, it's, it's all based on a sample that we use in the SNES samples. And I think it's derived from, it's, it's in two places. It's on a drum machine called the R8. And it's also this very similar sample, if not the same sample, is used in the Emu sound card because it was used in Perfect Dark, I believe, as well. Robin was demonstrating on online. I was thinking, well, that sounds like the same sound indeed. Oh, that's so really it neat. Was just throwing back to those 80s kind of sounds that we were using huh. at the same time. So it's not the same sound, it's a recreation of it. Oh. You basically get a tambourine and slow it down by 24 cents, um, two octaves. Huh. Wow. And that, that's how you make that sound. That is really interesting. That's really cool. I'm going to that... try that at some point too because I have a tambourine. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's that's exactly what I was going with with this track. Yeah. Uh, and the other bit is um, I'm using a thing called SD3, Superior Drummer 3, and it's got a very Stuart Copeland-esque type of drum kit in there. Mm. And um, I think when I was writing that, I, I, I was listening to some of his stuff because he'd done Spyro 3, so I, I, I thought it'd be a nice opportunity to get that kind of sound for the drums as well. Oh, that's okay. really cool. So the next track that we're going to hear is also off of Ukulele and the Impossible Layer. This is going to be The Overworld Beach, uh, and this one was composed by Grant Kirkhope. Right, that was the Overworld Beach theme from Ukulele and the Impossible Lair, composed by Grant Kirkhope. Also composing on that album was Matt Griffin, Daniel Murdoch, and David Wise. So, Grant, what can you tell us about this one? There's a lot that I like, and I'm not sure, you know, like what's a live recording, what's a sample, but the steel drums in particular are really, really well done. And like, I don't listen to a lot of steel drums, but when I do, like, <laughs> I, I, yeah, they sound they, like they this. sound very good. Which library did you use for those? I think it might have been the contact. Is it, isn't it that you get that free with contact? I feel like it might be in the contact, um, you know, the library they give you with the thing. I've got a okay. funny thing that might be in there in the world music section, I think. Okay, so, sounds very good. Well, That's you good. know, I always think like, you know, the things you have, the tools are only as good as the people using them, right? right? So you can spend vast amounts of money buying super fancy fat sample libraries, but if you can't use them very well, they just sound crap. <laughs> so I think that because me and Dave spent such a lot of our years, making awful things sound reasonable. <laughs> you, know, you kind of learn to sort of, you know, 
make things sound like human beings are playing them. Mm. So there's nothing on that track that's live. It's all samples. Wow. Um, oh. Um, so you just have to, you know, play it a bit out of tune or play it a bit out of time or, you know, think about what a human being might do with it. A lot, a lot of people just tend to put things in exact time on all the time and it just sounds like a machine's playing it. So mm. I think we do spend most of our time making things sound like a machine is, isn't playing it. You know. Yeah, it's it's more about making the performance from the instruments, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I think, and I do think that's that harks back to when we had to make awful things sound, you know, <laughs> listable. <laughs> yeah. Well, all the ukulele, all the bits that I did on the, on the second game, they're possible there. It's the same tune, overworld tune, just played again to suit the different area. So, it's, so that's why it sounds like the main tune because it is. Right. So all those, apart from the boss thing I did at the end, the boss layer, the, the rest of the other tunes are all just same tune played on different instruments to reflect the area that they're in so you know you, you just mess around i mean that sample lab is bloody years old isn't it that one on the contract it, it is yeah yeah it's absolutely it. years yeah and also it's like you can't have a beats level without steel drums can you do <laughs> you can't <laughs> <laughs> like the beat you've got there as well it sounds very beachy yeah it's just not allowed is it and all you know yeah. and like i think like it's like treasure trust cove you know or like steve Wales used to always say to me hey, you got to get the steel drums in there for the beats level so you know that's like you do. Ultimately, we spend a lot of time in our offices, but really, I'm dreaming about sitting on a sun-drenched beach, <laughs> drinking a pina colada. Yes. Yeah. like these where you really appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, yeah. it, that's <laughs> funny because when I'm at work, I'm thinking about interviewing David Wise and <laughs> Grant Kirkhope. That's interesting. Oh, uh, we're thinking about sitting on the beach, drinking a pina colada. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Grant. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Too right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Uh, what Grant was saying earlier about how he just makes stuff sound like a little offbeat or a little off key or whatever. And it's it just in my mind, like many musicians spend their lives trying to, you know, get things right and get it to sound, unless you're doing jazz in which case you have a lot more freedom but like you're trying to be on the beat and, and mm. sound like perfect and whatnot and then as a video game composer trying to make something sound more realistic than automated you're you're actually trying to make little mistakes that you would hear in in like actual music and that's yeah. it's an interesting thing to hear it's funny to hear the key to making good video game music at least for the rare camp mm -hmm. or the x rare camp is adding human error yeah in a lot of ways like adding a musician vibe that I think a lot of video game composers don't add to their music. Mm. And so that's what's missing from a lot of stuff. There's such a huge focus, like especially if you listen to a lot of the Japanese composed like video game mm. music for like mm. the Super NES, Genesis, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is on point. There's no mistakes. Everything is laid out the way it's supposed to be. Right. And even if you listen to a lot of the rare music, it's got that rare charm. Yeah. You know, and I think that's carried over here with the ukulele and uh the impossible lair. And of course Ukulele. For sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, just a little bit about the game Ukulele mm. and the Impossible Lair is a side scrolling 2D game. It's different from Ukulele in the sense that Ukulele was more of a 3D banjo Kazooie style. Right. You mentioned earlier collect a thon in mm -hmm. the sense that you're going around collecting a bunch of things. I think that term kind of came to be, though, with the Donkey Kong Country series, in all yeah, honesty. Yeah. Pro so, probably. just a game where you're just going around collecting, you know, all the different coins and bananas and all different things. But in this game, uh, you play as Yuka, a male chameleon, and Laylee, a female bat, and you are saving this bee queen. Her bee land is being taken over, so you are saving the bee queen's mm -hmm. land from the bee bad guy. Ah. Yeah, yeah. So let's get into our next track, which is our last track our last track and that is your pick justin what did you pick for that yep so this is going to be the impossible layer 2 this is the name of the track from ukulele and the impossible layer and this one was composed by david weiss
Welcome back. That was Ukulele and the Impossible Layer, which came out in 2019 on the Switch, PS4, Xbox One, and PC. The track was The Impossible Layer 2, and it was composed by David Wise, with Matt Griffin, Grant Kirkhope, and Daniel Murdoch also composing on that soundtrack. So what can you tell us about the composition on Impossible Layer 2? So I go cycling quite often, probably most days, and I, I cycle for an hour or more. And when I'm going at really tough hills, I've got this breathing technique where I'm breathing in for longer than I'm breathing out because it just helps with your carbon monoxide levels. So it, that's why it's in 7-4 and 5-4. Hmm. Huh. Okay. I breathe in for four. Uh, sorry. Yeah, breathe in for four and go out for three. And because I'm, I'm doing it in that rhythm, whilst you're pedaling, you kind of get lots of ideas for, for tunes, and that's where that particular one came from. Hmm. So the two ideas come from... Uh, my, my cycling exercises that, that I do daily. That's, That's really, really cool. cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's where the idea came from. Huh. It seemed to be the level. I know with your earlier music, you took a lot of inspiration from all different types of music. I've heard like anywhere from blues to jazz to honky tonk to uh, pretty much anything like early like rock or blues based. When it came to composing for this game as well as ukulele, would you say that? the tracks that you worked on were you wanted to bring like a different genre or different style or were you kind of guided by either the producers or the creators of the game or even like Grant because I know Grant kind of set the boundaries for a lot of the songs with the first game. In the first game it was Grant who phoned me up and said look do you want to come and do some work with Playtonic so yeah. that's how I've been involved okay. and Grant set the, the tone for that game and it fitted in with the stuff that they'd done at Rare. Mm-hmm. And for this second one, it seemed to be darker, that impossible layer. So it gave me a bit of free reign to write some darker tunes, which is what I, I normally wouldn't do. I, I find it quite hard to write boss levels. So it was, it was a good opportunity to, to really dig into trying to give some suspense and chasing and the darker kind of material that I don't normally work with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah. that was fun. And also, we, we also said that when we, when we started ukulele together, we both said that ukulele was probably more, more me and the next game would be probably more Dave, and we kind of we, do, we already thought that, didn't we? Because we kind of made it planned to do a 2D game. We said we, we, that's much more Dave's thing. He's got that much better than I can do it. And I, I kind of put the first game as more Banjo Kazooie. So we kind of knew that we we're going to split it up more. So Dave's got more info on the second game. I've got more info on the first game. Okay. So yeah. So like whatever the next game is, could be somebody else. I don't know. Or, or... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so all the Impossible Air tracks, for the most part, they all kind of have this cohesive sound where they all sound like a mixture of i would say david and grant combined (laughs) so we'll start with david how was it working with not only matt and daniel but also working with grant on a soundtrack because you guys i don't recall ever working on something together at the same time right outside from ukulele one yeah worked on dream together didn't we we did yes Yeah, yeah okay so, so that was uh, in the last millennium, that was. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and we also, we also worked on Star Fox Adventures because Grant did some. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yes, oh, absolutely. Oh, Grant that's did right. Marvelous yeah. trumpet playing and some even more marvelous guitaring for Fox Rocks. In... <laughs> did you do the guitar on the uh, credits as well? Yes, that would be it. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's incredible Grant Kirkhope <laughs> <laughs> giving it some welly on the guitar. So it's marvelous. <laughs> That was, uh, I've really enjoyed doing that one. That was yeah, uh, good fun. Yeah, some some great memories from from then. Working with Platonic because I know that's mostly filled with a lot of X Rare employees. I believe it's uh, Chris. He does the Killer Instinct. Sutherland. Chris Sutherland. S- yes. Sutherland. Yes, you're working with him as well as several other Rare alumni. How is the vibe in? Platonic compared to the days of Rare? Is it kind of like a class reunion every time you go to work there, or is it like kind of a new thing that you have yet to experience? It's pretty much a class reunion, if I'm <laughs> honest. It's like slotting back into old ways, but with more freedom. Okay. <laughs> as far as the composition of the tracks on Impossible Lair, what is it that you wanted to do differently from Ukulele as far as the music goes for both of you? I didn't do very much on on the possible layer, but I only did the overworld and some variations. Mm-hmm. So I guess like on the boss layer thing. So I guess like what five or six tunes. Mm-hmm. So we started off wanting to make it very small and very non-orchestral, mm-hmm. and they didn't want me to be like 
I didn't I want a ukulele. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's that's why it sounds that master sounds a bit smaller, not not so not so big. Mm -hmm. But the big reason why I, I guess me and Dave didn't write more tunes on the Impossible Lairs because Gavin Price was just too tight to pay us. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the that's the honest truth that you just wouldn't pay any money, and so we said we're going we're to get you and Dave to do a little bit. So we can use your names, mm -hmm. and then uh, we'll get Dan and Matt, who are very good composers, by the way, to write the most of it. So that's yeah. what happened. So that's the truth. Gavs is too tight, and that's all there is to it. Right. <laughs> okay. So now is the time at the end of the episode where we pick our favorite tracks from the entire episode, which is going to be very, very difficult. <laughs> but we're going to leave it to our guests first. So, uh, yeah, so we'll start with David. David, what would you say is your favorite song out of all the songs that we have here? I would say probably Sticker Bush. And also because when we did the original game, DKCT, we weren't going to have a water level. And I'd written it for a water level. And because <laughs> there was no water, it nearly didn't end up in the game. It's hmm. just because they were running out of time in the production and they needed something for the brambles. They thought the juxtaposition would be quite nice. Mm -hmm. So that's my favorite one. That is a very intense level, so yeah. that, that makes <laughs> a lot of sense. And Grant, how about you? My favorite is uh, Mad Monster Mansion. Oh. I like to write that because I kind of have to try to get, find a way to make dark chords not scare the kids. <laughs> and that's when I sort of got to listen to Danny Elfman's Beetlejuice and realized going to umpa, 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 umpa yes. makes things sound jolly, even <laughs> though they're dark chords. So I kind of, that's that idea sort of lit a light bulb button on my head and so that I realized that I can make the... I can do Mad Master Mind with dark chords, but make it umpa umpa, and it doesn't sound so dark. And Justin, what is your favorite pick of this episode? So I am kind of torn between two, and I think I'm just going to pick them both for different reasons. <laughs> so for older stuff, I would go with Banjo Kazooie, uh, the Secret Fanfare Four Mad Monster Mansion track. Okay. Um, mostly because I really just like all the goofiness of that track. Uh, I like the the fanfare in the beginning, although I think the fanfare is the same on each of them. The Mad Monster continuation, it just, it's fun. I like it. And then if we're looking at ukulele stuff, it's going to have to be Uphill Battle. Uh, okay. I, I really enjoyed the, the, the bombastic boss theme. Okay, I can see that. I did really like that secret fanfare mm -hmm. track. That was really good. <laughs> I think I'm going to go with, as far as the non-ukulele stuff, mm -hmm. I have to pick Sticker Bush Symphony. Oh, I oh, absolutely have to. Of course, of yeah, course. It's just completely my jam. It's one of my favorite songs mm -hmm. of all time. Yep. So You and like half the world. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. It's such like a basic song. Basic white boy song. I'm a, ba I'm a basic VGM <laughs> lover. By picking I mean, that track, it, it's 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 a it's a good song. I, I, the, I think the only reason that I didn't pick it is because I don't have as much nostalgia for that particular franchise. Sure. but it is rightly known as a one of the best VGM pieces out there. So. Yeah, for sure. Otherwise, for ukulele, I'm going to go with ukulele and the Impossible Layers Factory Fright. Ooh. I love the vibe that David brought with this track, and it's definitely a nice throwback to Donkey Kong Country 2. Mm -hmm. Really just anything to do with Donkey Kong Country 2, I'm sold on. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of Grant's, I think I would pick the uphill battle as well. I think that was a lot of fun. Fair, fair. So we want to thank Grant and David for stopping by the episode. And of course, we definitely want to thank Platonic Games and Materia Collective for allowing yes. us the opportunity to interview these guys. What do you have uh, coming up down the pipeline, and where can people find you on the internet? Nothing I can talk about. All super secret, as usual, <laughs> uh, of course. But I've just done that, the Wrong Rock uh, animation for a friend of me and Dave's, and Mike Kaywood, who used to be at Rare as well. Uh, that's that little uh, uh, animation that I did that's kind of won quite a lot of awards at festivals. So it's, uh, that was a, and it's really super high-quality animation because Mike's really brilliant. Cool. And I'm also just working on an indie movie called Shadows right now for my friend Michael Matteo Rossi. I think that's all I can mention right now, I think. Uh, yes, that's probably it. And you are uh, at Grant Kirkhope also, on Twitter? Yes, I'm at Grant Kirkhope on Twitter, and I'm also Grant Kirkhope Compose on Instagram mm -hmm. for the young people who used Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm, yeah, yeah, that's where I am. I'm pretty sure I follow him on both, so yeah, yeah everybody else should too. And how about you, David? Like Grant, I have three projects on the go at the moment that I can't talk about because they're all in the strict non-disclosure agreement, so <laughs> when you're when you're a composer, there's there's lots of stuff you're doing that you'd love to talk about that sure. you simply can't. 
one thing I can talk about is I've got a, a collector's album that I'm doing with myself and Kevin Bailey, who was obviously one of the 3D artists or main 3D guys at Rare. Mm. And he's also a good singer as well. So we've got this concept album coming out called Salamandos. It's going to be digital, obviously, but the main thrust of it is a vinyl album with an eight-page colour um, inset with all the graphics done by Kev as well. So he's doing the vocals oh, wow. on it. That's cool. And um, he's doing the, the the graphics there. So hopefully that'll be ready early summer, really. Um, we may delay it a bit more because of this corona thing. We want to um, <laughs> obviously go yeah, bring it yeah. out when, when times have changed and things are a bit happier. Mm -hmm. So if anybody wants to find me online, you can find me at davidwise.co.uk, which is my website. You can find me also on Twitter at David underscore Wise, and I'm somewhere on Facebook as well. <laughs> okay, very cool. As, very as cool. David Wise. Awesome. So, we'd like to take a moment to thank our Patreon patrons, without whom this show's continued improvement would be impossible. They are Alex Messenger, Scott McElhone, Cam Worma, Chris Hart, Dan Lawton, Chris Murray, Kung Fu Carlito of the Heroes 3 podcast, Jordan and Anson Davis, Chris Myers, Lama Adam, Jeremy Rutz, Peter Panda, Bedroth of the Very Good Music VGM podcast, Jason Super Jess Doss, Nick Davis, Matthew Hanola, Brad Austin, Muddle Madness, Mixmaster, and The Autistic Gamer 89. If you would like to become a patron, you can sign up at patreon.com slash xvgmradio. There you can see the different tiers as well. Just $1 gets you a thank you and access to our monthly live shows. You can visit our website, xvgmradio.com, where you can listen to all the episodes and learn more about your hosts, as well as any of our guests or composers that we've had on the show. If you'd like to reach out to us, you can always email us at xvgmradio at gmail.com. And if you'd like what you've heard, please consider giving us a rating on iTunes and a review. You can also join our Facebook group and chat with other VGM lovers at www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash xvgmradio, where we talk about everything from current game news to sharing awesome VGM tracks or just talking about the podcast itself. And you can find us on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle for both of those sites is at XVGM Radio. If you don't have any other social media or just want to try something unique, check us out on our Discord group chat. Links will be in the show notes. Justin, in two weeks, I don't think we could top this, but we're certainly going to try. What nope. do we got? In two weeks, we're done. This is it. This is it. There's no more. <laughs> nope. In <laughs> no. two weeks, we're going to get Nobuo Uematsu. Oh, I mean. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, so in two weeks, we are going to be back with an episode all about running guns. Yes. Running guns specifically are games where you run around with guns. There, there you go. That, that is you it. <laughs> and there are some really amazing songs for running guns. And we're going to talk about them in two weeks. Um, yeah. So this is Mike. And Justin. Signing off for XVGM Radio. Just for, because in Spaghetti Westerns, there's a lot more spaghetti. horns. There's a lot more spaghetti. That's true. Uh, so shortly after this, I think you did Viva Pinata. Yep. Mm -hmm. At that point, you went freestyle. Uh, or, yeah, freestyle. <laughs> you went freestyle. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Um.